Audible is my, my road trip companion. It's kind of my quiet alone time. Audible is a, is a routine for me. It's like a fun night school for adults. I could easily be seduced into locking myself in a place where I do nothing but listen to books. <laughs> I never was interested in historical fiction before, but I'm obsessed with it now. There are a lot of like classic and big titles that I, I feel like I've missed out. Since I don't have time to read, may I might as well listen. If I want to catch up on the news or history or learn what's going on in the world, I can download a book and listen to it. Because I listened to her story over and over again, I made the decision to go ahead and follow my own dream, which was to help other veterans. I think there's like 180 books in my, in my library now. It changes your perspective. It makes you a different person. It's true. It's so true. <laughs> Download Audible and start listening today. Hello and welcome. I'm Samia Carla Mungla and I cover healthcare in California for the Los Angeles Times. Thank you all for tuning in to the 25th Annual Festival of Books and our virtual event, Science and Medicine, Looking at the Coronavirus and Pandemics. We're going to talk about the history of pandemics, the spread of disease, and how the coronavirus will change the way we live. Joining for our discussion today are Nicholas Christakis, sociologist and physician and author of the new book, Apollo's Arrow the profound and enduring impact of coronavirus on the way we live. We also have Deborah McKenzie, whose new book is COVID-19, the pandemic that never should have happened and how to stop the next one. And finally, Sonia Shah, author of the recently released The Next Migration, but who in 2016 released Pandemic, tracking contagions from cholera to Ebola and beyond. Before we get into our conversation, I want to remind everyone to support your local independent bookstores during this festival. You can order all of these authors' books from Small World Books. Nicholas, Deborah, Sonia, welcome. Thank you for Hi, having everyone. us. Hi, thanks for joining us. So over the past uh, eight months or so, as we've all lived through this pandemic, I think a lot of us have been wondering how much of this was preventable. And Deborah, the title of your book is COVID, the pandemic that never should have happened. And so I'm wondering if you could start out by just talking a little bit about this. How much of this was inevitable and how much of the course of this pandemic could have been changed? Well, a lot of it was inevitable because you know scientists have been predicting a pandemic of some sort. The risk of pandemic has been going up. Um, for a decade or two, and people have been getting increasingly worried about it. But I said it should never have happened because this particular virus was really predicted in some detail. People say, oh yeah, well, they said a lot of other viruses could go pandemic too, but not quite like this one. I've never seen um, scientists put poised for human emergence or poses pandemic risk in the title of a scientific paper. And they did with viruses that were related, sorry, I'm moving the water so the cat won't knock it over. Um, they did with viruses that were very closely related to the one that is now causing COVID-19. Um, you know, there, there were labs working on this thing and, and they knew that it posed a real risk of, of, of going pandemic. And yet we didn't do any work on, you know, we didn't pick up where we left off on uh, coronavirus vaccine research. We started some after uh, another coronavirus, SARS, gave us a, a warning shot in 2003. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't, we, we'd abandoned that. We didn't go back to it. Um, we didn't uh, have mechanisms in place to respond to a, a virus like this if it broke out and went pandemic. You know, all of our pandemic plans were for flu. Yes, we're going to have a flu pandemic sometime. But, you know, this one was also a, a, a real risk. And, and nobody was really ready for it. And, and of course, the final thing was that we had rules in place saying, if you get something like this, tell everybody, and then that failed. Um, the, 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 the information didn't get out properly and we didn't get a chance to you know, respond quickly. It's questionable how well we could have responded even if the information had gotten out. But you know, we just totally missed the warnings on this. Um, that hopefully is something that's changed because I think people just didn't believe this sort of thing could happen. And you know, now that it has, you know, maybe we'll do a better job with the next one. That's the second part of the title, how to stop the next one. 
Yeah, Nicholas or Sonia, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree entirely. We've known since 1940, we've had hundreds of these new pathogens, either, you know, newly emerge, um, brand new ones, or re-emerge into new places. So, you know, we had Ebola in West Africa, where it had never been seen before. We had Zika in the Americas, where it had never been seen before. We've had new kinds of tick-borne illnesses. We have, of course, HIV, which started this you know, this trend really started taking off in, in the last few decades. Um, so this idea that, you know, a pandemic has been brewing has been, you know, that's been known for a long time. Um, and we just keep throwing the dice. And eventually, when you throw the dice, you're going to get the right combination of virulence and transmissibility, that sweet spot right in between. And that's what SARS-CoV-2 has done. Yep, totally. I might add, especially if you keep putting bat poop in your eye. I mean, <laughs> there's an eye remedy uh, made out of droppings, not to put to find a point on it, from the very species of bat that carries these viruses. You know, people are trying to think, oh gosh, where could this have come from? Well, has anybody looked at that? I mean, I'm not saying it did come from that, but you know, it's another thing we could have done, you know, put more distance between ourselves and bats. Sorry, just you know, you you just maybe think, yeah, that's one thing we could certainly do. Yeah, oh, that is a vivid detail. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have this definite false sense of security about pandemics. Yet we actually live in an age where pandemics are increasingly common because of the the way our society is set up, how much global travel there is, and that's one of the things that's been really fascinating to me uh, to learn in the past several months that while we think our modern world, something like this could never happen in our modern world, our modern world has actually made the conditions for a pandemic really ripe. Uh, and Sonia, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and what some of those factors are that we think of as advancements like you know, global travel that actually can really make a pandemic very likely. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think we blame travel a lot, but I think there's other factors that are probably even more um, critical. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's also useful to understand that pandemics haven't gone away. I mean, we're living through this one right now, but we also still have an HIV pandemic that is going on. We still have a cholera pandemic that's going on. Um, so in a way, what's new is that many more of us are now exposed to the reality of living with a pandemic. Um, these other pandemics have been mostly ghettoized in poor people in poor countries, so they don't really rise to the to global attention the way that this one has. Um, but we've been living with this risk all along. Um, and I think one of the main drivers is this interface between humans and wildlife that Deborah just mentioned. We know that 60% of the new pathogens we're seeing come from the bodies of animals. About 70% of those are coming from the bodies of wild animals. And this is related to a, you know, a global phenomenon, which is that we're destroying so much wildlife habitat. Um, that means that we lose a lot of species. We're losing about 150 species every day, which is a huge crisis in and of itself. Um, but the species that remain have to crowd into these smaller and smaller fragments that we leave behind for them. And those are more frequently near where we live, where our farms are, where our mines, where our towns and cities are. So when you cut down the forest where the bats live, they don't just disappear. They fly over and live in your backyards and gardens and farms instead. And that's really the underlying factor that allows uh, the pathogen, the microbes that live in animals' bodies to spill over into ours. These are probabilistic events, and we make them more and more likely because of the way we're interacting with nature. And there's something in particular about, you mentioned bats, and bats have been linked to many emerging diseases, and I think there's a couple of theories about why that is. And Nicholas, I remember reading in your book, you mentioned some of those uh, reasons why bats may be more likely to to pass on these diseases to us than another species and maybe you could touch on that well i mean actually many uh many new uh newly emergent diseases have in fact just as you said uh come from bats and there's some as you said there's some theories about that one has to do with the fact that bats are of course mammals and so uh pathogens adapted to the bodies of bats if and when they do get to us tend to uh, be easier for uh, more infectious to us as opposed to for example 
uh, pathogens adapted to you know birds. Now, of course, there are many avian flu species. This is not a uniform phenomenon, but that's one issue. Second, there's some speculation that there's something really interesting about bat immune systems, such that when uh, pathogens get used to living in bats, they're pre-adapted to affecting us. This is not well worked out, but there's some theories about this. And finally, bats can fly. Uh, they're the only mammal that can fly. And so they can move from place to place and uh, come into exposure with many more people. And when you couple this with the, some of the arguments that Sonia was making correctly, in my view, that climate change, for instance, is bringing animals and humans into greater contact, we're destroying their environment or the climate is destroying their environment, they're reaching us, or climate change is causing human migration and we're encroaching on their territory, you have greater human-animal contact. And this results in what's, what Sonia described, which are called zoonoses, which are infections that uh, afflict animals, but then occasionally leap to us, just like simian, simian immunodeficiency virus um, became human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and many other examples. I should say that the longstanding pathogens that we have, for example, like measles uh, and, um, and smallpox uh, and tuberculosis, many of these pathogens came to us as a species when we domesticated their ancestors, their, their ancestral hosts. So for example, there's a good evidence that measles uh, previously was a, a, a virus that afflicted cows. And around 2,600 years ago, leapt from cows to humans after we had domesticated the cattle and after we built uh, settlements, high density settlements. And, but, but now, 2,600 years later, it's sort of a human, uh, human virus. We're used to it. Right. I think a lot of people don't realize that a huge number of the diseases we're very familiar with also came from animals. But like you guys have explained, it's just the increasing contact with those animals makes it more and more likely. Which I should say that I should say there's nothing on the, as as um, uh, um, as Deborah was highlighting originally. There's nothing unexpected about this. So respiratory pandemics have afflicted us every 10 or 20 years, well, for at least 300 years. And, and for example, many people listening to this may or may not remember that in 2009, we had an H1N1 pandemic. But the reason people don't remember it is that it was so mild, it didn't really kill us. So it swept the globe and it was another respiratory pandemic and nobody remembers it. Uh, but in 1957 and in 1918, we had very serious respiratory pandemics, of course, by a different pathogen, influenza, whereas now we're talking about a coronavirus, uh, and people remember that. So the pandemics they, uh, are come every 10 or 20 years, and every 50 or 100 years, we have a serious one, and we have the unfortunate experience as a species right now, we listening to this, of being alive at a time when a respiratory pandemic, a new, new virus, has been introduced into our species. Yeah, I feel as though the, both SARS and H1N1 gave Americans a sort of false sense of security when it comes to pandemics, or maybe people in general, but particularly Americans. Uh, and maybe, Deborah, you could touch on sort of why SARS and H1N1 went so differently. Was it just luck or was it a response that was much more uh, aggressive than what we saw now? And uh, I'm also, maybe Nicholas, you could, after that, you could talk about, you mentioned in your book that your own wife didn't believe you when you said you thought, you know, the pandemic was going to come, that the coronavirus would come to the U.S. And I'm curious about sort of what it is about our thinking that makes us so reluctant to accept some of these uh, problem, things that we sort of were like, oh, it could happen. But when it's really happening, it's hard to, to find acceptance with that. Well, you want to be just like me or Deborah first. Let's have Deborah go first. <laughs> <laughs> Luck, basically. Um, SARS. I mean, uh, um, Sonia mentioned the sweet spot in uh, transmissibility and and, and virulence. Um, basically, SARS uh, was really virulent. Um, it, it it had a. We we think maybe the the case fatality rate on um, on COVID is about one percent, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Um, on, on SARS, it was more like 10%. It was nasty. Um, but also, uh, it didn't spread until it caused symptoms. 
and that was its downfall. We could get it with, uh, well, anybody who developed a fever who'd been exposed, we just tell them to, to self-isolate, and that was enough to get it. There, there wasn't the asymptomatic spread. It made all the difference. There was an aggressive international containment campaign led by the WHO very capably at the time, um, which actually put paid to it. it the, the virus went extinct um, because we managed to cut off um, all further transmission in the outbreaks uh, that we were handling. We were also very, very lucky because uh, the top guy on this, David Heyman, at the WHO at the time said, you know, we're stuck with this virus. It's here to stay. You know, it's going to get into a big city where we can't contain it because it's just not, you know, there's a lot of slums. It's not well regulated. Uh, and it's just going to move in and we'll never get rid of it because we won't be able to contain it. That didn't happen. We were just lucky on that one. And we were lucky on 2009 as well. Um, it was a, a swine flu. Um, in 1918, people have mentioned the, uh, the flu pandemic of 1918. We gave our flu to the pigs. They've had it ever since. And they've had a lot of other kinds of things starting 10 years before the 2009 pandemic. They'd started getting these rapidly evolving um, hybrid flu viruses that were swapping around the surface proteins at an enormous rate. Um, but among the surface proteins they were swapping around, um, was uh, was one from the 1918 virus. Now that circulated in humans until um, the uh, uh, the pandemic that uh, Professor Kustakis mentioned um, in 1957. Um, now I'm just old enough to have been born just before that. So the first flu I saw, I think Professor Kustakis was born just after that. I'm not entirely sure, but I think so. Um, basically. I saw those viruses, that, that virus before, because the one that came out in 2009 just happened to have two big proteins on the surface, the ones that the immune system recognizes, um, that were pretty much similar to the flu that was circulated in the early 50s when I was born. And that was the first flu I saw. And for some reason that we still haven't quite worked out, the first flu we see is the one we remain especially you know, resistant to. We, we've got you know, our immune systems are just learning what to do. They really latch onto that one. So the older people um, in 2009, you know, both of my kids were pretty sick. I didn't even cough. You know, we, we'd seen this flu. We could, we could, you know, fend it off. We didn't realize this until they started giving the experimental vaccines to older people and discovered they only needed one dose instead of the two doses you should normally need with a vaccine for a virus you've never seen before. We'd seen it before. We only needed a booster. Um, and so the older people who usually die of flu weren't dying of flu because we'd seen that one before. Same thing happened in 1918. The very old people um, weren't dying of it because something similar had spread uh, long about 1850. Um, and so, you know, those people were not dying of the flu that spread in, in 1918 then because they'd already been exposed. I mean, there's, there's this, this history, but that was just luck. There were other surface proteins that that thing could have had. For example, even now a relatively mild virus that's adapted to humans, H3N2. Um, all the signs are that this year is going to be an H3N2 year. That's gonna be the dominant virus during flu season in a lot of places. Um, people like me have to watch it for that one because you know, that was not the first virus we ever saw. Whereas um, um, Sonia and Samia, I, I suspect you're laughing because you know, that you'll, you'll be a whole lot more resistant to that virus. It's a matter of age and exposure. And you know, if that had been on the pandemic virus in 2009, I think we'd have seen a lot more death. And in fact, we did see a lot of death. You know, I'm tired of hearing it was mild. I was talking to people in, in, in um, emergency rooms in Winnipeg who had you know, ICUs filled with with dying people from the First Nations communities. You know, they they were you know, people in the 30s and 40s. You know, really more more deaths than usual occurred in 2009 um, in those age groups than normally does. We certainly lost more years of life because more younger people died. So it wasn't that much of a walk walk in the park, really. It didn't kill a lot of old people, so okay. But you know, it 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 was more lethal at younger ages. So we lost a lot of years of life. Yeah, it does feel like people are able to just not pay attention to it. Even H1N1 did kill a lot of people and so did SARS, but if it didn't cause a lockdown order that you know upended your life, people, a lot of people don't remember H1N1, even though it definitely had a big effect. Remind me what your question was. Uh, <laughs> I made a note yeah. about China in January, but 
I lost track of the question. The, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just curious about the sort of psychology of the accept, uh, making the mental leap to accepting that a pandemic is coming. You had mentioned that like you were one of the earlier people, probably compared to the general public, who thought that we were going to have uh, coron the coronavirus was going to reach the U.S., and yet it was hard to convince other people that that was yes. the case. So, um, so you know, I was sort of vaguely, like many on this audience, uh, reading the news in January and vaguely aware of what was happening uh, in China. But I really didn't start paying attention until some Chinese colleagues of mine contacted me in January. I had been working with them for years using phone data. Uh, we had records of millions of people, anonymized records, and could track who they were calling, again, anonymized, and where they were. And we had been using these data to study other phenomena, like how earthquakes might disrupt social relationships, for example. And these colleagues uh, uh, contacted me in January and to talk about how we might use these data to study the pandemic that was brewing. And so I began to turn my attention to more clearly and scientifically to what was happening in China. And we eventually were able to use data on 11 million transits through Wuhan, the central one of the central transportation uh, hubs in China, uh, at, 11 million uh, transits through that uh, transportation hub as people in the month of January, as people spread out through all of the rest of China. And we were able to show that the intensity, uh, timing, and location of the coronavirus pandemic in all of China by late February related almost entirely to the number of people who had uh, gone to that location from Wuhan. And that paper was published actually eventually in April, that scientific paper. But this meant that by January, I was coronavirus had my full attention. And then on January 24th, the Chinese uh, basically gave orders to confine 930 million people to their homes. And that really got my attention. I mean, the Chinese felt that the adversary that they were facing in this virus required them to, in essence, detonate a social nuclear weapon. That's how powerful they thought it was. They put a billion people under home confinement January the 24th and did not begin to release them till late March. So what, what were we thinking? I mean, when this was happening in China, why weren't we preparing? Why weren't we manufacturing PPE? Why weren't we preparing testing capacity? Why weren't we manufacturing ventilators? Why weren't we, most importantly, preparing the American public for the sacrifice that would be required and the inevitable reality that we would have a global pandemic. No reputable epidemiologist that I know, when we were all corresponding you know, behind the scenes, everyone was gravely alarmed, as Deborah was telling us, as Sonia was telling us. I was, by middle of February, I was completely convinced that this is what was gonna happen, what has been happening. And the, the story I tell in the book, which you allude to is, in my own household, the difficulty I had persuading other members of my household, you know, who who, you know, thought that I was, you know, uh, had become a prepper, you know, and was somehow <laughs> fantasizing about Armageddon or something, which is not the case. Anyway, so, so, um, so then that's what happened. And then what I really don't understand is, is that as the virus spread, okay, so initially we thought, okay, well, this is a problem in China. Why we th would think it would stay there is unclear. And then in February, it, it affects Italy, and Italy collapses. Now we have a rich democracy, a rich European democracy, and then what did we think? And then it affects New York. And then people in Houston months later are like, well, now it's affecting us. And now it's in Bismarck, North Dakota, or in Utah. I mean, this, this denial, you see, that, that people can't believe that what happened elsewhere would affect them, is itself a feature of pandemic disease. Lies and denial. If you think of plague as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, lies and denial are its squire the horseman squire. They follow right behind the germ. In fact, for hundreds of years, lies and denial have been inexorable features of plagues, so much so that you might even say that lies and denial are part of what it means to be a plague. Wow, and of course we see with this pandemic, we have all sorts of blame games going on, different countries being blamed, different groups of people, and that, like you said, is not a new phenomenon. I know. Sony has written about this with other diseases, specifically cholera. I'm wondering if you can just talk about the way that our societies for hundreds of years have been 
uh, choose to ascribe blame for pandemics onto specific groups. Are you yeah, talking I mean, to I, me or just I, Anya? I, in my book, I trace no, that. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, one of the examples I use in, in my book, Pandemic, was about cholera, which, of course, when it emerged in the 19th century, was a brand new disease that no one had ever seen before, hit the most advanced, cutting edge cities of its time. Um, and people kind of instantly decided it was an Asiatic disease, something from far away, some foreign thing. They blamed the Irish immigrants, then they blamed the Muslims, then they blamed the Eastern Europeans, and, and so on and so forth. Um, refused to see how commerce and you know the way ships were traveling down canals and bringing cholera with them was spreading the disease. Refused to see that and blamed the poor, blamed alcoholics instead. Um, so, you know, and, and we're seeing the same thing today. We're seeing, we, we've seen it with almost every outbreak of brand new disease. And I think it really comes back to the stories that we tell about, you know, how we frame the narrative of what this thing is that's happening to us when these emerge, when these diseases out of nowhere come in, and start stalking us. And I think the, the paradigm through which we've sort of understood these is as, as a form of invasion, you know, that there's this sort of foreign encroachment from somewhere far away, some strange alien being, a microbe, a stranger, something outside of us that then encroaches upon us and invades us. And we're sort of these pure, uncontaminated, passive victims of these foreign intruders. Um, and I think that lends itself very well to scapegoating, because then, of course, you can say, well, this is not a problem for us. This is the problem of Wuhan or the Chinese, and, and it lends itself to certain policy responses that we saw, um, which was to immediately close the borders. You know, that was one of the most common policy responses across the globe, really, after the outbreak in Wuhan was, okay, let's, uh, you know, no more travel from China into our country, and okay, good, we're done, we're, we're safe now. Um, with no recognition of how connected we are without long distance travel. People don't, you know, stay within their borders. They're connected between them and visit family and go to school and, you know, all that stuff. So things can travel and radiate out even without a long distance, um, a long distance movement. And we saw that by the time, you know, Wuhan was locked down, 7 million people had already left that city. Thousands of people were already infected in Europe and coming into North America. So this spread had already happened. Um, but the way we, we talk about these diseases as something that we have to, you know, repel with our armaments and our weapons um, as, as an invasion, you know, we saw a lot of that rhetoric when um, President Trump here has called himself a war president and, and China called their, their battle with coronavirus, you know, the people's war. Um, I think President Macron said he was a war president, you know, this idea of invasion and that what do you need when you have an invasion? You need weapons, right? You need chemical weapons, you need killing chemicals, you need vaccines, you need drugs. And of course, we do need all of that. Um, but we're not going to get that stuff fast enough to save ourselves from this first wave. Um, and I think that's why we really need to talk about these diseases in a new way. We need really a new narrative to frame them so that we're not thinking of ourselves as passive um, victims of an inc foreign encroachment so much as, you know, these are things that we have agency in. Um, these are things that we can, if we work together, if we have sort of solidarity with each other, we have collective action and cooperation, those are things that actually can protect us. And we're seeing that now where we have many uh, we have many non-pharmaceutical interventions that could work, but they require political will and they require collective action and cooperation. And that's what's really lacking today. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas or Deborah, do either of you want to add to that? Well, actually, um, it's that point about collective action that, that I think um, that, that's what stumps me. I'm, I'm, I'm rather hoping Professor Christakis will, will address that because um, what we have lost is the idea that freedom involves responsibility. Um, you know, like the, the mask thing just, just encapsulates it. You know, no, you're infringing on my freedom uh, to, to make me wear a mask. Okay, we also don't let you drive your car down the sidewalk. <laughs> you know, it's much the same thing. Um, we're, we're asking you not to kill other people. You don't have the freedom to do that. Um, but that connection somehow is not being made anymore. I'd be interested to know what social science tells us about why that is happening now. 
Can I add? Can I add to that actually before before Nicholas uh, chimes in? Which is one thing I wonder about is the complete lack of um, sort of public memorial to the deaths that we're seeing and how that plays into our perception of the risk and whether we should change our behavior. Um, and of course, you know, we know our hospitals are overflowing right now, but I'm just thinking back, of, you know, in the time of cholera where the, the church bells were always clanging and people could see the carts uh, carrying the dead going down the streets or with HIV and the quilts and the, you know, we did so much to remember the dead. And so it was top of mind that that was happening all the time. And we just have not done that in this country, hardly at all. All these people are dying and we're just, we're not talking about, we're not memorializing them. We're not, we don't have flags at half mast. We're not, you know, we're not doing any sort of public observance of that. And I wonder how that plays into people's perception of how risky this thing is and how much they have to change their behavior. Because then it's like, well, the worst thing that ha is happening is I have to wear a mask, not that all these people are dying and that's why I have to do this silly little thing that's only a little bit inconvenient. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but I wonder if other countries are memorializing the dead differently because that does, it definitely changes your perception. The more you know about the dangers of the coronavirus, the, I, believe the more willing you are to to make those sacrifices like wearing a mask because it doesn't feel like a sacrifice when it starts to feel like a very small thing to combat a very big problem um nicholas do you want to lend some uh well, I, was gonna, expertise? I was gonna i was gonna comment on the on the um the ways in which human beings the virus exploits some of our most deep-seated features our desire to be friends with each other to live socially to touch and hug each other uh, to work together and form groups to cooperate, it, the virus exploits those things, and uh, how we in turn have to use those very same weapons to fight the virus. And so I was going to talk a little bit about that, but now I got distracted by something that was said towards the end that you guys were talking about, which is, if you think about it, as uh, Deborah mentioned earlier, the best estimates we have of the infection fatality rate of this virus are between 0.5 and 0.8 percent is the IFR which is the fraction of people that are infected that die. Um, but there was a recent paper in Nature that said that number might be 1%. The so-called case fatality rate, which is the probability you'll die if you get symptoms or come to medical attention, might be twice those numbers. Anyway, let's use 1% as an approximation in ignoring some of these epidemiological details. Let's say 1% of people who get the disease die. Well, uh, I think we're on course in the United States, given the intrinsic infectiousness of the virus and given certain other, uh, which is the, the R0, the R sub zero, the, if, uh, the uh, basic reproduction number, the number of new cases that are created for each existing case, which characterizes the intrinsic infectiousness of the virus, that number is between 2.5 and 3.5. It's about three, let's say. There's a lot more subtlety there, but let's just say about three. And that number in turn dictates the ultimate fraction of the population that will be afflicted with a condition, the so-called attack rate, or the rate at which you might reach herd immunity. And if you do some further mumbo jumbo, I won't go into having to do with network science, you wind up getting an estimate of about 40 to 50% of Americans are ultimately gonna be infected by this virus. Let's say 50% to keep the calculation simple. 330 million Americans, 165 million is half of that will be infected. 1% of those will die. That's 1.65 million deaths if we did nothing. If we had no vaccines, we just let the virus go through our population. So if you begin to think about uh, the situation we're facing right now, we have about 230,000 deaths, probably 300,000 excess deaths, that is including the deaths we're unaware of due to coronavirus. We're for sure gonna surpass half a million Americans die and maybe as high as a million. I think in the end, when the pandemic ends in two or three years, because there'll be a third wave as well, and maybe even a fourth wave, those waves might be less intense because of a vaccine, but they'll still occur. Um, between half a million and a million Americans will die. If for each person that dies, there are 10 people that know them intimately, and for each person that dies, there may be 100 that know of them. So you might have 10, best friends and family members, but 100 people who kind of know of you, coworkers or neighbors or whatever, even if a million Americans die, only 10 million people approximately will actually know someone who died of this condition. And maybe only 100 million people 
will be aware of someone who died. So even at the end, the majority of Americans will not have had up close and personal contact with the death. And in a way, this reflects partly what Sonia said about the lack of memorialization, and partly the fact, as Deborah was talking about earlier, that this virus, while bad, is not as bad as it could have been. We're actually, but the, by the grace of God, we're not facing a situation like in the movie Contagion. This, we could have had the same virus with many of the same epidemiological features that could have killed 10% of the people or 30%. SARS-1 in 2003, as Deborah said, killed 10% of the people afflicted. MERS, another coronavirus, which has not gone pandemic for other reasons, kills about 30% of the people. That virus emerged in 2012. So it's just by the grace of God that we're not facing that type of a situation. But the bottom line is, in this situation, not enough people are going to die so that people have upfront personal contact. And this is why, and then I'll shut up, this is why I think it's so important that we have effective leadership in this country that calls Americans to sacrifice, to common purpose, and to maturity. We cannot be like children wishing away this calamity. You might go to the dentist and the dentist says you need five root canals, and you might pretend you don't need them, but you still do. And it's an awful truth that you need them, but you must endure it. And this is the situation we face. We have to face this squarely. We have to face it collaboratively. We have to face it honestly. And we will need good leadership and good communal effort to see the other side of the pandemic. But we will see the other side because plagues always end. And so we can talk about that too if you want. Uh, because you mentioned uh, federal leadership or just sort of national leadership, I, I'm curious, you know, we're talking about what President-elect Biden will do when he comes into office and uh, there's talk of another lockdown. And I'm wondering, um, and I'll just open this question up to any of you, what, like if you had to say, what are the like five main things in the U.S. that we're not doing that we should be doing uh, from a national level that would really bring this uh, take us to a much better place than where we are now? Well, if I could speak from outside the United States, uh, when you say you lock down, you don't. You know, it's it's got to be serious. I can't leave the house right now without a piece of paper saying why I'm outside the house. Uh, and, um, you know, and a piece of identity. And, um, you know, and there are policemen out there who say, wait a minute, you've already been out for an hour today. What, you're walking the dog again? Um, well, maybe it wasn't that bad, <laughs> but, you know. There are limits, you know, we are locked down. They mean it. But then what nobody has really done so far, except the Chinese, it has to be said, and of course, Korea, which never got that bad, and a few other countries, is you do lock down to get the numbers down. And then when the numbers are down to the point where you have a chance of tracking all the cases and isolating them. And I, I think um, Nicholas was pretty um, dubious that this would work. Um, uh, in, in, in your book, the bits of it that I've managed to see. Um, but uh, basically, there are countries that have made it work. I mean, you know, Korea made it work. Once you get it down far enough, then you use test and trace to stop every case from generating a whole bunch more and to really try and stop super spreader events. People have tried that to varying degrees in various countries, but mostly, you know, we're getting pandemic fatigue. They're not making it stick. I don't think... Um, Lockdowns in the States, maybe in some places they've been fairly strict, but I get the impression from afar that, that they really haven't been, you know, strict enough. And then they're not followed up with test and trace, which would stop the few cases that remain after that from getting bigger. You know, you've, you've got to, that's, that's what you do. There's no point locking down unless you then try and keep the numbers down. Nobody's really pursuing that stringently enough. It should be said that China did. Um, and in fact, um, um, Professor Christakis was mentioning that they locked everybody down. They certainly put everybody under uh, various degrees of social distancing. But the only cities that had to totally lock down like that were the ones in Hubei, Wuhan and its neighbors. Outside of that province, no big city had to totally lock down. Not, not the way we're locking down here in France at the moment. People could leave their houses. They mostly didn't have to shut shops and, and, and workplaces. They, they stopped big gatherings. They shut down a lot of transport within the city. They shut down transport between the cities and, and your 
certainly, you know, you've, you've probably looked at the data from mobile phones that, that shows how much that was shut down. They did a lot of that kind of thing, but they didn't have to do total lockdown. And everybody cooperated. You know, if you had a fever, you went into quarantine. You didn't mess around. You didn't say, oh, well, gee, we'd kind of like to ask you to go into quarantine. Like, you know, they do in Britain. The, 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 um, the cooperation with a quarantine order in Britain is estimated to be at about 20%. You know what? Why are you even bothering to try? You know, if you're going to do it, you got to make it stick. This is why I'm 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 so one so concerned about absence of, of any thought of collective sort of responsibility. I think some of the things uh, Nicholas just said really spoke to that. Um, nobody's been doing that though. Nobody's been saying, "Look, we're all in this together." I think some leaders in Europe have been trying to. Um, the president of France has been trying to, but you know, we still are are not making much of success of, of test and trace, you know? Um, do, do, do you guys feel that that's kind of just a non-starter, that it's never really gonna work? Because nobody, the Chinese have made it work, the Koreans have made it work. Yeah, but I mean, you know? we're, it, it absolutely could work if we got, as you said, the numbers down, but the virus is on the loose in our society and probably 12% of Americans have been infected and that case counts are so high. And if you aggregate those over a two or four week window, many millions of Americans are infected and we just don't have, there's just no way to do contact tracing anymore, as you said, with that scale. So I don't think, um, I don't think, uh, even, if the, even if there was an American appetite for locking down to get the case counts down, just as you say, uh, then and only then would we be able to realistically, in my view, implement some kind of test and trace procedure on this scale in a nation of this size with this many people already infected. But there are other things uh, absolutely that could be done better. I still don't think we're doing a, as good a job as we could be with testing. I still don't think we have as good a job as we could be with masking. Um, I agree with Deborah that I don't think people are taking it seriously enough. And I think if, if people could, and then most importantly, I think we don't have the public health messaging. If people could come to understand that if they did a few things, then some of the more severe things, they might be spared. You know, if everyone in a community were masks and kept physical distancing, then maybe they could keep the schools open. Uh, or if they had, a, you know, there was plentiful testing and people did physical distancing and people acted responsibly in the fashion that Deborah alludes to, maybe we could keep the businesses open, et cetera. Um, so I think, I think that, that pillar, that public health messaging pillar is, remains crucial. And I think, you know, I, frankly, I think the uh, Trump administration has been appalling in this regard. Um, Lead, you know, encouraging fantasies that the virus would disappear or that hydroxychloroquine would be an effective treatment. I mean, these these things were known to be false, even by the president, we now know. And uh, these these falsehoods were promulgated. And I think this has hurt our efforts and also hurt the credibility of leaders whose credibility we will need if we are to see the other side of this. Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to the underlying crisis of our whole response, which is that at the same time that we're having this biological crisis of the pandemic, we're also having a governance crisis. And the only way that we can get a testing, tracing, and supported isolation system to work is if we have a massive supported stay-at-home order. You know, people, we need to get the virus levels down, like Dr. Christakis said, but the only way to do that in a humane way that doesn't have a whole lot of you know, other fallout is with massive support for businesses and people who are going to lose their livelihoods. And that requires action from the federal government that is completely at a stalemate right now. So, you know, there's not a lot we can do with that without that kind of leadership. And the governance crisis is really at the heart of the scattered and chaotic response we've had to this um, to this pandemic. It sounds like all three of you are agreeing that the only way out of this current surge that we're seeing in the U.S. with higher than ever recorded case numbers, hospitalization numbers, is a lockdown and a, a one that's more uh, more intense than what we've seen in the U.S. So if we're not going to get that from the federal government, should states be taking that step to, especially states where things are really bad, and should it be at the level of what Deborah is living through in France? You know, you need a piece of paper to leave the house. No, I, just to be clear, I wasn't saying we should do that. I was saying that we might be spared that if we if we take a number of other steps. We just need enough, a, enough layers of defense that we might be spared that. And, and I just need to mention that 
there might ultimately, right now, the public will is not behind this, and our politicians are not suggesting this course of action. But by the time enough people start dying and people's relatives are turned away from hospitals that the people themselves want it, if the politicians do it then, it'll be almost too late, right? The whole point of this is to take the action before it's required, given the intrinsic exponential growth of, of epidemics. So just, I was not suggesting we needed to go to a lockdown, but we need to do a lot more, in my view, than we're doing now to spare us, if we can, that outcome. Got it. Okay. So to, right, if we don't do a lockdown, there's a lot more that we would need to do. And at the moment, we're not, we're not having a lockdown and we're also not if, doing all. If we want to avoid death. I mean, the, the only thing that seems to actually produce any kind of political will so far in this country is when hospitals are overwhelmed. So that's, that's the only time to date that we've actually had political will to say, okay, yes, let's do a mask mandate. Okay, yes, let's reduce, you know, uh, the business hours of restaurants and pubs and such. Um, so, and, and, and like Dr. Kristak has just said, once you get to that point that the hospitals are already uh, completely saturated, it's, it's almost too late. And then when we do those things, we're doing them in a very half you know, half in, half out way where, you know, maybe we have 50% compliance at best, even in those states that are actually putting those, um, those measures into place. Oh. Uh, so this week there was news of the Pfizer vaccine that appears to be 90% effective, at least for a limited period of time. And there's been some talk about how a vaccine should be distributed, whether it should be uh, to the most vulnerable, which I think is probably what most people think. But there's also an argument that uh, the vaccine should go to people who are most likely to spread the virus. So people who uh, would maybe be super spreaders and are moving around a lot. Uh, and uh, Nicholas, I know you were uh, earlier, were planning to share a little bit about how the virus sort of preys on our social networks. And in your book, you cited some research about how during flu season, people who have the most contacts like get the flu earlier. And I thought maybe you could weigh in on sort of this idea of giving the vaccines to those very popular people and what we know about sort of how our social networks influence our, uh, how likely we are to get sick when there is a virus circulating. So you summarized the, the coolest idea already, and I'll just restate that and add a little bit uh, a little bit to it for the listeners. So um, what what Sumia said was that you could imagine a very rational strategy if there's when the vaccine is initially produced and you have the first 20 million doses, who should you give them to? Okay, you give the first million to doctors and healthcare workers and the people who participated in the vaccine trials that were on placebo. They should be first in line to get the effective vaccine. But now you've done a million of those and now you have 20 million doses. Who should you give them to? One very commonsensical thing to do would be to give it to vulnerable people, people with chronic illness or the elderly, for instance, and this is what Sumya said, but, um, and you might help them and prevent their death, but actually those people are at the end of transmission chains. That is to say, elderly people or homebound people aren't out and about circulating the virus. They, the virus is brought to them. So another strategy that has been repeatedly proposed for for decades is instead you give the vaccine to people at low risk of death who are working age adults and are out and about. And, and that can be very difficult to muster the political will for that because you have to explain to the public, yes, I'm giving it to people who are at lower risk of dying, but I save more lives by giving it to them because if they become immune because I vaccinated them, we stop the transmission of the virus. And so this is, this is the a dilemma that can arise in terms of vaccine distribution. I think an optimal public health strategy would probably involve some combination of those, where you allocate some initial vaccine to especially vulnerable, chronically ill people, for instance, elderly people, institutionalized people, but also release some of the vaccine to people who are out and about. Um, and in my own laboratory, we've done a lot of research on this. It turns out that if you give the vaccination to people who have many friends or popular people or people with many social connections, you can in sometimes, by almost an order of magnitude, multiply the effectiveness of the vaccine. And, and the intuition there is that if you had someone that was a hermit and had no social interactions, it'd be a waste of a dose to give it to them. Conversely, if you have someone who has many social interactions, many friends, very vivacious, whatever, 
and you give them the vaccine, you can stop them from being a, a transit point a, and a highway for the spread of the vaccine. So anyway, there we could talk more about that, but I would wind up being very overly focused on my own abstr you know, abstruse research interests, but that's the gist <laughs> of it. Uh, Deborah, Sonia, is there anything you wanted to add about this sort of idea of vaccinating the super spreaders? Um, I mean, it, actually, it's an interesting Dr. idea that you could go to, where, where would you find these people? So I guess you'd have to go to go yeah. to the pubs and find the loudest, loudest people there. You know, I guess that would be the trick is like, how do you separate out who are the extroverts so we, and who are the introverts, we, right? We No, you wouldn't need to do that. We, we published some work in my lab on a trick. It's using something called the friendship paradox. You would, you pick people at random, you ask them to nominate their friend, and then you give the vaccine to their friend. This is uh, this relates to a fundamental mathematical property of social networks, which is that your friends have more friends than you do, which is mm. kind of distressing to most of us, but it's a truth. And so we've we've done some randomized controlled trials looking at this exact idea and shown that shown that it works. Actually, we have a big trial in Honduras right now. So you can get much more bang for your buck uh, if you vaccinate the the friends of random people rather than random people, for example. But 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 how do you? Uh... I mean, not to go down too far into this rabbit hole, but how, how do you how do you get Please, vaccine acceptance? Let's do that. You're just randomly oh, no, selecting no, people. Great rabbit hole. <laughs> well, no, but you could you could do it you could do it, uh, Sonia. But you also, as as Deborah or someone was suggesting, or maybe you were suggesting, you literally could also go to pubs and restaurants and find people there and say, okay, I'm using this as a marker for people that are out and about. And in fact, there's a very interesting idea. During the uh, protest for the killing of George Floyd, uh, many people, myself included, had expected that um, these mass protests might contribute to an acceleration of the epidemic because people were, 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 were gathering large numbers. Of course, it was outdoors. They were wearing masks. It was, it was lower risk, but still not a good thing during a time of an epidemic disease. But some analysis done by other researchers has shown that actually it seems like the, these protests did not lead to an upswing in cases. And they had a very interesting theory as to why. And the, and the theory was that while a smaller part of the population, namely those protesting, those people who were protesting, increased their social exposure, everyone else in the community said, look at all these people out and about, I better stay home even more. So on average, social mixing didn't necessarily go up. Some people interacted more, but all the elderly and other people and so forth hunkered down more. And so, in fact, what we could have done is we could have said, oh, let's just go vaccinate the people that are protesting. That would have been a marker of, you know, people who are socially engaged. And, and that, you know, could have been a, a, a sneaky way, let's say, to find out people who are out and about. I mean, I guess like the, the other, I, I think what's going to really happen is, you know, we're going to be very much constrained by the reality of how you distribute this vaccine. It require, depending on which one comes out first, but the ones that we're looking at now need to be, you know, kept under extreme refrigeration with the cold chain, negative 80 and such. There's a lot of states where there's maybe only one or two places that can actually distribute a vaccine like that. So I think there's going to be a massive sort of you know, a, a vein, this is going to travel through the veins of inequality once again. You know, who who has the really the logistical support to distribute a vaccine like this, and who who's a, who has the vaccine acceptance that they're going to actually go for it? I mean, those are those are things that are going to actually shape um, how this vaccine gets distributed. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too about the idea of vaccinating super spreaders. On the one hand, I can see people being upset that people who take less precautions would get the vaccine first, but then if there are a lot of people who don't want the vaccine and so they would be happy for someone else to get it first. Um, so we're gonna switch. We have a, a little bit of time left to some audience questions. Uh, the first one is a question from Mary, which is what is the most puzzling aspect of the coronavirus? And what does that mean for future coronaviruses? Anyone want to take that one on? If I could jump in, I suspect the way in which it elicits immunity. Um, with, coronaviruses are, are, are um, a bit of a problem with immunity. They've been trying to make vaccines to some of them, uh, in particular one that affects cats uh, for decades. And, and it's, it just doesn't work very well. Um, 
But in fact, that opens up another question uh, entirely. Um, one was, as, as you probably read, four of the viruses of the 200 or so viruses that cause the common cold in humans um, are coronaviruses. Uh, one of them, OC43, I think Professor Christakis has a really interesting hypothesis about that, about when it entered the human population. Um, if I've got this right, if I'm remembering right, and my brain is a bit fried because I've been working flat out for weeks, but um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we thought there was a big flu pandemic in 1890, except weirdly for a flu pandemic, it did seem to affect young children. Um, and at about the same time, some uh, scientists in Belgium actually uh, discovered that uh, OC43, the coronavirus, that was when it entered the human population from cattle, as it happens, in Central Asia. Um, and the hypothesis is that so-called flu pandemic, I mean, in 1890, we couldn't you know, isolate a virus. That was actually OC43. And now it's a cold virus. It's still circulating, but we've all been exposed to it as children when we didn't get sick. And we're all pretty much immune to it. And that could be the long time term future of this coronavirus. The most mysterious thing about coronavirus is, uh, is the kind of immunity it causes. Obviously in you know um, all that time, more than a hundred years, OC43, it's still circulating. We're never perfectly immune to it. You know, that might be what happens with this virus. But that's not such a bad thing because it doesn't cause us that much trouble. If I have got that correct, Professor Christakis, please tell me. I might be remembering it wrong. I think you highlighted, you summarized the story correctly, and I think you highlighted this immunogenicity of the virus, which is one of the more puzzling things. I was going to shift the question and say one of the more irritating things, which was what I think you pointed out earlier as well, which is that the virus is transmissible before patients are symptomatic. And that has, you know, very irritating feature of this virus. It makes it much more difficult to control. Well, that's why we still have an HIV pandemic. Yes. Yeah, and there's been research with uh, this coronavirus that people are more infectious right before they're, they're most infectious right before their symptoms start, which I remember doing interviews early in the coronavirus in this pandemic, and a lot of the coronavirus researchers I talked to are like, "Oh, there's it's very unlikely that people would be submitting or shedding the virus before they have symptoms," and that just ended up being completely untrue. Uh, Deborah, you mentioned the sort of long-term outlook for the pandemic. So now, you know that 1890 1890 uh, coronavirus pandemic. Now the coronavirus, uh, that coronavirus is not very dangerous, but we have another audience question from uh, MG, which is, how do you see the pandemic ending and when via vaccines, herd immunity, or whatever else you think might bring it to a close? I mean, those are two, those two things are almost the same, right? We either need to get to uh, herd immunity through natural infection or through the vaccine. But I, th uh, I'll, I'll, I won't say much because I think the other uh, panelists will probably have more to say about how it ends. But one thing I will say is that it will end with a whimper, not a bang. So it just sort of will peter out. Um, and I, I predict we'll, we'll barely kind of notice it as it fades into, into the past, um, especially with the, the, the third and the fourth waves, which will be, you know, probably less intense waves, but but still present. Yeah, I have to say, I'd agree with that. I think Professor Christakis has calculated, if I'm remembering this right, that we'll be looking at a 40 to 50 percent attack rate um, in late 2021 going into 2022. That's about when we're going to start really being able to mobilize vaccine on a large scale. So it's a toss up whether getting the virus or being vaccinated is the one that's going to make most people immune. I mean, we're going to, as you say, so I mean, we're going to get to herd immunity eventually. And the thing will keep circulating. The thing is that I think it's a bit of a problem that everybody is thinking, oh gosh, you know, when a vaccine comes, we'll all be saved. Well, for one thing, the first vaccines, I mean, we don't have this data from Pfizer yet, but what I'm hearing from, from vaccine developers is um, the first vaccines are very unlikely to stop the virus from infecting people and then being passed on. It's not widely known because a lot of uh, human vaccines don't do this, although some do. Um, that you can be vaccinated, you don't get sick, you've got enough immunity to defeat an infection if you get one, but you can still be infected and you can still pass the virus on, which means that we're, we haven't stopped the pandemic. We've stopped people dying, that's good. We've, we've uh, gotten rid of as much demand on the hospital system, that's good. But 
the virus will still be going. And then when it gets to somebody that hasn't been vaccinated or was one of the few people who didn't respond to it, if we're lucky, and the other vaccines also have a 90% rate, um, then those people are in trouble. So we still have to worry about trying to do things that will lower spread. It's not all going to be over tomorrow when we get a vaccine. The other problem with that that I looked at in my book a bit um, is that there are some pathogen evolution people who think that um, having a situation where a lot of people who've been vaccinated uh, are getting the pathogen and passing it on, they're, they're facing the pathogen with a whole new situation that it's got to adapt to. And it might well adapt by getting more pathogenic, more, more virulent. That's been observed with a number of pathogens now because you're not gonna die. It's not a problem, you're, up, you're vaccinated. You're not getting sick. The pathogen is free to get more virulent because that might allow it to you know, infect you faster and, and replicate faster and get out of you into somebody else faster than the next pathogen. So it's gonna be an evolutionary advantage to do this. They've seen this with diseases in chickens, for example. That's how we got H5N1 bird flu um, that was so pathogenic because they were vaccinating for it. And it just got got and stayed really deadly because there was no reason not to. It didn't kill the chicken. Um, and that's what happens with something called Marex disease in chickens as well. You vaccinate the chickens, the pathogen gets a lot more virulent. Then it gets to unvaccinated chickens and you're in trouble. I mean, people all have this idea that pathogens automatically get less dangerous as they circulate. I mean, because it's not always in the pathogen's interest to kill you off, then yeah, that can happen. But what the people who studied virulence and, and pathogen evolution tell me is that it can go the other way too. And having a lot of people vaccinated with a vaccine that allows them to pass on the pathogen might promote a kind of evolution that we don't like. The pathogen could get worse. So, you know, it, it worries me a bit that the standard story you hear from people who aren't specialists in pathogen evolution is, oh, well, pathogens always get more mild when they circulate because they can't kill you off. Well, yes and no. You know, it, it, if HIV hasn't gotten any milder, it, it doesn't care. You know, you're not even sick by the time it spreads. I mean, and you know, this one, it could be a problem. If we have a lot of people who are vaccinated, they're not getting sick, but they're spreading the pathogen on. That could cause a selective pressure on the pathogen that might make it worse. Just something kind of depressing that some people are telling me. This is why I have a cat in my office. Kitty, get away. Yeah, right as you got really dark, your cat came to the give you some comfort. <laughs> I was trying to be positive by mentioning the OC43 thing. I mean, this thing could be the common cold in like, you know, 20 years, but. <laughs> uh, so we have time for one more question. Uh, this one's from Althea. What is your opinion on schools and universities going back on campus for the spring semester? Spoken like an epidemiologist, sir. <laughs> Is that true for everywhere in the U.S. or uh, are there certain pockets where, I know you mentioned, uh, Nicholas, that if we, you know, if there was a community where people took a lot of precautions, then they could sort of create. No, I think, I mean, you could safe, attempt, but. you could attempt it, of course, and, uh, and um, you know, there are colleges that are open now, and I think colleges can implement sensible procedures. Um, the, the thing I want the listener or the questioner to understand is, is that it won't be like the college that you had in mind or that existed a year ago. So even if it opens, it'll maybe you'll be on campus but be having virtual classes. Maybe the students will be encouraged or prohibited from having parties. Uh, masking will be required and testing and so on. So you'll have to do quite a bit of things to get to, to get some semblance of a collegiate experience. And um, and it might or might not be worth it. And and the risk of that is cases on campus, but even more spread of the pathogen off campus. So I don't. I'm not. I'm not saying no schools should open. Nor nor am I saying that every part of the country should have exactly the same policy. But I am saying that it it would be difficult to imagine that it would be possible to resume safe uh, or. There's no risk-free life right now when there's a deadly germ afoot, but it's hard for me to imagine that we could have widely open campuses with in-person classes in a way that wouldn't pose too high a risk to be tolerable. Yeah, I'm guessing that the latest surge will have will change the minds of people who maybe were planning to do this in the spring. That'll look very different in 
January or whenever we would go back for spring semester. Uh, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, thank you, all, all of you in our audience, for tuning into this important conversation. And thank you to Nicholas Christakis, Deborah McKenzie, and Sonia Shaw. We really appreciated your time and insight today. And finally, another reminder to support your local independent bookshop. Copies of today's books are all available through Small World Books. Thank you all for joining. Our pleasure.